Thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, greetings from Singapore. Joining me on this Saturday evening also. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to my fellow Malayali engineers uh, after a very long time. Okay. With that, let me get started. The topic today that I'm going to talk about is data analytics, a tool for business revival. Okay. All right. So the agenda today, I'm going to start with something very general, the changing data landscape, by which I mean how data has evolved in volume, in size, in expectation, in demand, etc., etc. Where the data is coming from, why is there so much? So this is a general kind of outlook. And then moving on to what they mean by big data and why is it big? Okay, so that's a general kind of introduction. Then once you have data, what you can do with it, of course, is to generate insights, etc., uh, etc. Et so that will be the second part. That will be the data analytics, how things are done. Okay, so the point I will be trying to bring across at that point will be why communication skills are very important in for data scientists and data analysts. So that is the point I want to bring about. Okay, after that I'll get slightly technical, but not technical the way you used to. Just high level uh, overview of uh, what different tools are, wh what is it that you can do for different kinds of data that you have with different business problems that you want to address. Okay, then if you have time, we will move on to text analytics. That will be the last topic. I called it the biggest of big data. Of course, text is not really big data in terms of volume, but in terms of information, relevant information density, I think text really is uh, the king and uh, that there are, there are opportunities there for businesses and also for for technical people. So that's how I'll try to end if we can get to that. Okay. So before that, uh, I had this nice introduction, but I thought I would talk about myself mainly because I like talking about myself like most people do. So uh, what am I and who am I? So right now I'm an associate professor of information systems at Singapore Management University in the education track. Education track basically means uh, I'm more focused on teaching rather than research. And if I do research, that is more on the pedagogical kind of re research and pedagogy itself, tools for pedagogy. So that is uh, my focus right now. So I've been this for, uh, for four years. Okay, before that I was working with Standard Chartered as a quantitative uh, finance professional on their trading floor, trading system, the front office, taking care of their pricing models and uh, in-house trading systems, etc. I started there, then moved on to risk management, reporting, etc. on the IT side in the back office later on. So I was with Standard Chartered for about five to six years, I believe. My banking career started with a local bank, a regional bank, I should say, called OCBC and I was heading the analytics team, analytics team for risk management. Now, when uh, a bank says analytics, they don't actually mean data analytics, it's actually quantitative finance team. So basically a bunch of mathematicians, not computer scientists. I had about five or six mathematicians working for me in that team, and uh, we were basically doing things like uh, model validation in their trading systems, etc. So that's when I started my banking career, maybe about 12 years or so ago, 13 years ago now. Before that, in a different life, it's a different color because it's a different career and a different life. I was uh, a researcher, applied researcher, working at ASTAR. ASTAR is an agency for science, technology and research in Singapore. It's a government agency and they have a bunch of institutions here and there. And I was uh, working as a lead scientist in one of them, uh, looking at brain signals actually. Okay, and before that in a different color, in a different life, I was a physicist. I was working at CERN, as they mentioned, but I was working for the French government as a staff scientist at uh, an organization called CNRS. Okay, CNRS is uh, actually the French equivalent of ASTAR, and uh, that is uh, for National Center for Research, Scientific Research, that is the French way of saying it. And working at CERN, where they do Higgs and stuff like that, that was one of the the high points of my career, I would think. My physics career started with a PhD from Syracuse University 
long time ago, before some of you are act were actually born, I would think. Okay, and that is a nice picture from uh, the university campus in Syracuse. All right, and before that, in black, I was an engineer. I graduated from IIT Madras, and uh, with a BTEC degree in uh, electronics and com uh, electronics and communications engineering. And now this talk is being given to Indian aud audience, so I have a quoted message there, in, in parentheses there saying J E A R 63, which is designed to inspire some level of uh, shock and awe. I try this in, here in Singapore also, but it doesn't really work with an international audience, but any Indian audience will appreciate that. So I leave it at that, okay? So this is my career progression. So I started as an engineer, then I became a physicist, then I turned into an applied researcher in Singapore, then a quantitative finance guy, then a professor teaching now. Now, this is a slide I actually showed to my students in my first class of different courses, and I used to ask them at this point, okay, this is my evolution, where do you think I'm heading? And people would be kind of suitably impressed and they would be looking at me, then I would say something like, I think I'll become a philosopher, and uh, then I would get some kind of smiles and some appreciation. That was my plan usually. But about a year ago when I said this, when I asked my students, where do you think I'm heading? One sm smarty pants sitting to my right second row, the guy looked at me and said, grandfather? So I kind of stopped asking that question. So I don't do that anymore. But I think I will really become a philosopher at, the, at some point. Actually, I've already started. So I, ha I have a couple of books. The first book was actually on the philosophy of science. What is space? What's time? Etc. Etc. Uh, kind of bringing together different domains of knowledge, human endeavor, really, like physics, philosophy, uh, meta science, even spirituality. Okay, spirituality as in spiritual philosophy. So that is my first book. Very proud of it, the Unreal Universe. And uh, you can actually look it up and buy it if you want. And my anyway, my background is in scientific computing, data analysis from the scientific computing perspective also data analytics uh, as I am teaching now, and uh, quantitative finance, of course, and teaching. Lots of research and industry experience, so that's where I'm coming from. So if I draw examples uh, or uh, illustrate my points using some examples, especially when I have questions, those examples usually come from these uh, varied fields, okay? But it's not all work for me. I also play badminton. Uh, quite well for my age, I think. Pool as in billiards. And my hobby is quite ner nerdy. Hobbies are quite nerdy. PHP programming. That I don't do much these days because I don't get much time to. Writing and blogging also used to be my hobby. Again, don't get too much time to do that. But philosophizing, always happy to do that. Especially if somebody... Let's move on to uh, the talk proper. So I have to start by... Uh, trying to manage your expectations from this talk. This is not a research talk or an in-depth technical talk. Looking at the other topics uh, of this uh, webinar series, I saw that some of them were actually quite deep in terms of technical details. This is not going to be one of the, those. This is going to be something more like a big picture uh, business kind of talk. Okay. So if you're here as a techie, uh, engineer, computer scientist, or a practitioner looking to learn more stuff from me at this point, you might be disappointed if you're looking for technical kind of information. But this might be appropriate for people like business analysts, managers, entrepreneurs who are thinking of getting into the data space, trying to do something in that space. Okay, so that is to set the expectations up of the talk. All right bunch of questions, how, what, why, who, when, where, etc, etc. I'll try to answer those things. That will be the, the flaw of the, of the talk. Okay, so let's start with data analytics. Why? The reasons behind its uh, prominence uh, these days. Okay, why is it so popular? Okay, so I used to teach a course called the Analytics Foundation uh, a couple of years ago. And that is basically the introductory course in data analytics. At that point, I used to tell my students that analytics is going to be the practical and necessary skills for business careers, okay? And that really, I think, is true. In the last 
couple of decades actually, okay, maybe three, starting in the 90s or so, computer computer literacy was was demanded of uh, of a job candidate. If you're looking for an employment in the 90s or early 2000s, then you would be expected to be able to work with a computer, like you know, office uh, suit. Word, Excel, email, web, etc. That is basically computer literacy. Not the ability to actually program a computer, do uh, sophisticated things with a computer, but be able to work with a computer. That was expected of you. Still, it still is. But I think very soon, in the next couple of decades, people might be looking for not just computer literacy, but analy analytics literacy. That is my expectation. I think that tomorrow, that future is already here. Okay. So if you look at uh, my university, like I told you, there are six different schools. Each school is starting their own versions of analytics courses, basically because they expect it to pervade all fields of uh, management, business, etc., etc. So that is how it is looking. So it's, uh, it's the right time to be uh, in the field, analyti analytics field, okay? So, but why is it happening? What are the drivers behind this trend? Okay, so that's what I want to look at. So that will bring me to what I call the mega trends in the data landscape. Okay, let's take a look at that one. So there's the first mega trend that I see, or that not just me, everybody sees, is uh, the volume and variety of the data that is coming into the ocean of data that we have all around us. Okay, the second one is from the from the demand side. The first one is actually the supply of data. The second one is the pull factor, the demand of data, how data is being consumed. That also is uh, increasing dramatically. Not only that, the demand on data-driven insights generation, the speed with which they have to be generated is also increasing dramatically. That is about the data velocity, okay? And underpinning all these things, supporting all these things, are the changes or improvements in technology. So these are the different things that we have to be aware of. Okay, so let me put those things in perspective. The first one, there is a real veritable explosion of data these days that I don't have to tell you, everybody knows this, okay? So exponential growth in data volume in many fields, and this is expected to continue, okay? I'll actually quantify this statement in the next slide, and I'll show you different sources. Not only that, there are requirements, uh, anal analytical and uh, reporting requirements, periodic and even real-time requirements, okay? And the demand is getting more and more sophisticated. It's not just uh, a, a batch report that they want, they want in-depth analysis of uh, stress tests, etc., generated in real-time, okay? Coming from uh, not just regulators, but also even from customers, especially when the customers are other businesses, right? Okay, the next aspect of this, uh, the mega trend is actually the velocity, the, the need for real-time responses in, uh, in uh, insights that are being generated, okay? So that is the next aspect. Last one, there are innovations happening, not just on the hardware side, but also in, on the software side, that is actually supporting all these uh, for uh, all these three different uh, pillars of uh, data landscape. And that is something that we have to kind of understand, okay? Uh, I'm gonna talk about these things, not merely because these things are interesting by, by themselves in their own right, but also because you might see opportunities when you listen to these things, you might see, ah, that sounds like a place where I might be able to make, a, make my mark and do something special. So that's what I'm hoping to, to get you to, to achieve or think, think about at least, okay? So let's talk about the explosion in data, okay? There are data streams coming in from uh, sensor devices, connected devices, okay? Internet of things, device monitoring, health monitoring, even your phone. Of course, it is a sensor, or actually it's a multifaceted sensor and giving you a lot of data coming into the ocean of data that is all around us, okay? On top of that, you have enterprise data from things like uh, transactional point of sale data, CRM, call centers, with the call center voice data can be translated to text, uh, to text, okay? Then diagnostic data, quality control, et cetera, et cetera. That's another stream. Then you have 
data providers, especially in the context of banking, you will see uh, you know, uh, data streams coming in with uh, all kinds of uh, indices, their real-time prices, etc. Bloomberg's, Reuters, Thomson, and there are indexed uh, search providers, <coughs> specialized search providers. If you're doing something in the in the the IP space, intellectual property space, LexisNexis is one, Credit, Equ Equifax, etc., etc. Et then, of course, there are data providers on the government side too. They also generate huge amounts of data. Statistics, Tadboard in Singapore, for instance, okay? And those are all just the tip of the iceberg. The real data actually comes from uh, the data that can be scraped from uh, websites, okay? Social media. Uh, people put all kinds of stuff on uh, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, etc., etc., and Twitter these days, uh, you know, what's happening in the, in the U.S. Uh, with the president, right? Okay, and uh, search engine, engines also have uh, data being generated. Okay, now there are worrying uh, data sources, browser history, uh, web blogs like blogs, my own blog. Uh, there's this uh, comedian called uh, Bill Barr. In one of his uh, shows, he said something like, if you look at Facebook, you see somebody's profile, that's what he wants you to see. That is his projection of uh, his uh, personality that he wants you to see. But if you really want to know a person, don't look at Facebook, look at his browser history. A crazy thought, but that is really true. Okay, so that is a semi-structured structured data maybe, you know, RSS feeds, uh, XML, HTML, etc. But then there are streams of unstructured data also coming in. Instagram, YouTube, video, etc. And now TikTok, all kinds of stuff, right? And that is again only, only the tip of the iceberg. But if you quantify it, if I want to quantify it, in 2005, the data, the, the total volume of data in the world was 0.13 zettabyte, 0.13 zettabyte. In 2020, that actually became 44 zettabyte, 44 zettabyte. Zettabyte is actually uh, 1000 exabyte, and exabyte is 1000 petabyte, and a petabyte is 1000 terabytes, etc., etc. So if you want to actually compute the year-on-year -year growth rate, if you remember your high school logarithm, etc., etc., you can sit down and calculate, which I actually did, it is 47%, okay, 47% yearly growth, yearly growth. Every year it's grow growing almost by 50%, which is huge, which is huge. But that, again, is only the tip of the iceberg because the next stream is going to come from 5G when devices start talking to each other, not just people talking to devices or to each other, but actually devices having their own world of communication. That is where the real growth data, uh, real growth in data is going to happen. So... Are there opportunities there for businesses, new new business ideas? There must be. Imagination. Your imagination is the only limit there. All right. How are we doing so far? All good? Voice is okay? So that was the first aspect, the supply side of data, where the data is coming from, why there is so much of it. So you got some glimpse of it. The number I want, to, want you to take away from it is that 47% growth rate, okay? With no end in sight. It's going to go on like that. Now, the demand side, the pull side, the other one was, number one was the push side. This is the pull side of uh, data. That would be the demand for data-driven insights, okay? So look at uh, many different fields. Service improvements, for instance. Chevron, in the space of uh, oil and gas exploration and, uh, and production, they use real-time data coming from their drilling bits and uh, machinery to improve the efficiency and reduce failure. So that is service improvement based on data which did not or could not have existed some time ago, okay? So a completely different uh, uh, sector, hospitality, Disney, Disney World, Disneyland, etc., etc., etc. They track customers in, in their amusement park to optimize the usage of their area. So that's another thing. So what I want you to see is the, the disparity between the, the fields. One is uh, oil and gas, totally, uh, uh, you know, some, a completely different field compared to hospitality, which is a service sector. 
manufacturing and, and service. Now, looking at uh, process improvements, Amazon, a leader in uh, data-driven uh, technologies and uh, and uh, yeah, utilizations. So e-commerce, of course, they have personalized high-margin high suggestions. That, of course, comes from uh, something called market basket analysis, a topic I used to teach in my uh, in my analytics foundation course. Okay, actually, we'll touch upon it later today also. Walmart retail and uh, they are optimizing uh, their revenue per square footage with in conjunction with their CPG partners, uh, uh, consumer packaged goods partners, so that their supply chain can be optimized. When they run out, run out of something, the demand can be predicted and it can be filled even before they actually have to manually do this. So that is in the retail sector, e-commerce retail, process improvements. Okay, now there is there are other things existing business like auto insurance there is a company called progressive and uh, this is for auto insurance car insurance and they told their customers that if you are willing to put a device capturing your driving patterns a sensor device capturing your driving patterns in real time we will give you a discount on top of that we will be able to price your premium competitively so think about that so Auto premiums already different for different age groups, etc., etc., is getting more personalized. So it's a new product offering, and it's actually even more than that. If you think about it, what is insurance? Insurance is the idea that you can collect risk from uh, multiple sources. You can pull them together, and then give everybody the same premium, so that if somebody actually uh, hits the risk, you know, a one percent event, that can be covered by the 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 pool of uh, premiums that they that you have so that is the the kind of uh, uh, the risk management idea behind uh, insurance but if you are beginning to to price each person individually look at the limit the mathematical limit the asympt asymptotics uh, level of that idea what's going to happen i'm a, a fairly experienced driver i've been driving for i don't know 30 years or so so my insurance is fairly low my son is probably going to start driving uh, in a year or two, obviously is young, uh, full of testosterone and hormones, and is going to go mad maxing all around Singapore. Obviously, his insurance will be high. But if they actually measure his driving patterns and give him the exact right amount of insurance uh, appropriate to his risk, what does that mean? It means that if he makes an, a an accident, the premium that he pays will be just enough to cover that accident plus the margin. So that is almost like having no insurance at all, right? So the whole idea, the philosophical idea behind insurance also is going away by some of these, uh, these uh, uh, new offerings. Interesting to think about. But uh, yeah, bear with me. I uh, go on to some philosophical tangents once in a while. Anyway, coming back to the talk, entertainment field, streaming services like Netflix, they can use the history and uh, make uh, informed and optimized investment decisions, okay, for con content creation. That is another thing. So those are uh, new product offerings of potentially existing uh, businesses. But there are brand new business models also coming about because of uh, the prevalence of data and the, da the tools that we have to handle data. So there is a company, again insurance, health insurance this time, called Humana, and uh, they use predictive kind of analytics on a person's uh, uh, health parameters and indicators to reduce the healthcare, healthcare cost. Actually, I also started a company to do something along th these lines about four or five years ago. It did not get anywhere, but the idea was kind of similar. What we were planning to do, we were trying to do, was to uh, take the, the health indicators of the body sensor data, also the, the, the medical history, family history, etc. And then make informed decisions and tell the customer or the, the user to go see a doctor because you're likely to have a heart attack or your, your insulin level or your, your diabetes is probably going to be high. So go and see a doctor now. The idea is that preventive kind of medicine will be cheaper than, uh, uh, than uh, what is it called? Interceptive kind of medicine, right? If you have to actually 
do curative kind of uh, treatment that is much more expensive than preventive kind of treatment. So that was the idea. That is uh, what human also is trying to do, obviously more successfully than, than I could do or we could do. And now Nike also getting into that and there's things like uh, the Fitbit and even Apple Watch, etc. Bracelet to track ath athletic activities. Okay. The interesting thing is Nike is actually an apparel company. The sector is apparel. And then they're getting into something that is completely different because the because of the prevalence and uh, existence of uh, of uh, data driven uh, technologies, data data driven tools, and data driven uh, technologies. So that is the demand side of data. So that we covered two of them. Now let's cover one another interest interesting aspect of data. Okay. This is about the velocity expectation, the speed. Okay, that is quite interesting. If you have uh, used things like uh, Google Maps, etc., etc., you demand information in real time. If you're driving somewhere and you want to know if there's a traffic jam, it is not good enough if you are told five minutes or ten minutes later. You want to know the information now so that you can take a detour or whatever. Actually, I use a uh, Google Maps quite a bit uh, for some personal reasons. I used to go to Jakarta quite often till about till COVID struck. And uh, from the airport, the place I want to go to a hotel downtown is about an hour plus depending on the traffic conditions. And I use uh, Google Maps to see if there is a there is a traffic jam coming up. And it's amazingly accurate. And now uh, I that got me thinking, how do they get the data? Where do you think they're getting the data from? Do you think they have satellites or, or cameras monitoring uh, the, the 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 traffic and then making decisions based on that? No, it's not that. It's actually something much smarter. When you're using Google Google Maps, you are also providing data. You're consuming data at the same time. You're providing data back to them, so they know how fast you're going. They know how fast the people in front of you are going, and then they know if there is a traffic jam depending on the speed differential. That is very smart and uh, there is no way to use Google Maps without giving them the data. Even if you don't want to give them the data, then if you don't want to give them the data, you cannot use it because the, the app does need to know where you are, right? So that's an interesting uh, uh, dichotomy of uh, consumption and provision of data at the same time, okay? But the thing is, the expectation of the results, the insights coming out of data is instantaneous, it's real time. Okay, then the IoT in consumer packaged goods. Uh, there's this, uh, this uh, device called Amazon Dash. I've never seen it, but I'm told this exists. This can track different things that you need. If you put it uh, on your milk or, or bound your kitchen towel, when you're about to run out, it knows that you're going to about you're running out, and it knows from your usage pattern how much you want you would need. And it takes it upon itself to actually order it from Amazon, without you doing anything. And in the U.S., Amazon delivery time is like two hours, and two hours later, the stuff comes to your doorstep. The money is taken out of your account. Everything, everybody is happy. Okay, so that is a another instantaneous, near real time kind of performance, in driven by data. Okay. Now, another field where uh, dynamic pricing, not just in insurance, it's also airline pricing. And that also they demand near real-time performance in, uh, in uh, consumer spending patterns and uh, how, many, how many people are planning to go to uh, a city and based on that, they can change their pricing, dynamic pricing, a big money maker for uh, airline companies, again, until this uh, COVID-19 situation, okay? In logistics, in workforce, Amazon robot, robotics also is a big player, okay? Uh, order fulfillment, efficiency, etc., etc., using their own robotics. If you look at it, Amazon, as you can see, is a big player in this space. And if you look at the profitability and the stock market prices uh, of different companies happening during this COVID crisis, you can see that Amazon is doing extremely well. Why? Because of these... Uh, these uh, 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 innovations on, based on data. So that is important and it is uh, really a tool for business revival in these uh, trying times that we're living through. Okay. Now that the third one was the, the velocity expectation. Now let's move on to uh, why 
this all these things became possible that is the technology evolutions okay storage is cheaper than ever okay and so if you look at the cost uh, it is going down by about 23 percent if you again do the logarithmic calculation on that one that is about 23 percent but remember data is going up at the rate of uh, 47 percent twice as, as fast so maybe the price is not coming down fast enough okay but that is on the hardware side and on the software side there are the distributed file sy systems uh, necessary for uh, things like big data where data cannot reside on one computer and it needs distributed computing for uh, for uh, uh, processing and as well as aggregation of results etc so there's Hadoop and uh, other streaming architecture like Elasticsearch, Kafka etc and cloud solutions Microsoft there Amazon again web services and on top of all that free software Python and R Apache Spark all these things are actually driving the the consumer the consumption side of data and also the storage side of data so everything is coming together at this point in time to make the data revolution a reality okay so it in, it's in this context that I want to talk a little bit about big data so when I started my computing career maybe some 30 years ago or so things were basically data sizes were megabytes and they were kept in uh, CSV files text files some you know my own data formats handled by batch jobs that I, I would run when I need to and then it uh, became something more uh, uh, structured where data started residing in databases by the time I reached the bank it was that way and there would be periodic kind of jobs and the data ran into gigabytes and terabytes that's the evolution that happened and later uh, data started to be in social media and streaming services etc images audio video well audio at least and the performance needed to be near real time okay when you upload something on Facebook you don't want to be waiting for a couple of days before uh, that appears right and the data started becoming into terabyte and petabyte uh, range okay then once the media started clicking in YouTube uh, TikTok and streaming services like uh, Netflix Amazon Prime even Apple TV plus etc etc and mobile data of course the data became exabytes exabytes that's where we are okay now where are we heading in I think a very short span of time you will start seeing massive device to device communication and uh, creating data lakes with this advent of uh, 5G ultra low lat latency kind of uh, uh, infrastructure and data is going to be in the zettabyte range so data volume is going to grow tremendously supported by technology innovations okay and the performance in terms of uh, uh, the velocity requirement expectation will be supported by more slow the computing improvements and data variety also is going to grow exponentially it is this uh, this uh, structure that we mean by uh, the big data so big data basically is unstructured data not residing in any kind of a databases unstructured hard to handle huge so that you cannot load it into the memory of one computer it has to be on multiple computers then you need ways in which you can do things in parallel and then aggregate uh, results okay and insights so that is uh, my one slide about big data okay so we saw the why of data analytics why it is important and why how it came to be now let's look at uh, what it is what is data analytics it's the process of turning data into action from a business perspective so data is a large volume of uh, stuff the information density the density of knowledge in data is uh, fairly low it is spread out then you do some kind of uh, processing then you can you go up the pyramid you kind of distill information out of it okay and at that point you need quite a bit of expertise in data handling okay and uh, the tools are Python what have you 
and then you move on from there to more distilled or condensed form that would be insights added depth in the knowledge or information then the skill set actually moves from a, a technical skill set to a business knowledge kind of skill set so that is important to know that is important to real, realize when the value of information becomes more condensed and uh, more acute that is when the business knowledge the domain knowledge becomes important domain as in not the technical domain but the the domain in which you are operating your 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 core competency domain okay and finally when it comes to recommendations that has to be translated to to a business solution so you start with a business problem you end up with a business solution that has to be translated to a business solution only then only then can it be translated into an action so that is the value pyramid and uh, it is in this context that you have to kind of focus on your ability to communicate understand business uh, problems to begin with translate that into to technical problems and then in the end translate it back into a business action business decision business recommendation that is what i mean by communication in this domain not really the language skills or or the ability to make presentations etc but to be able to translate go from the technical domain to the business domain all right all right so uh, with that let's look at the skill set that is needed for uh, a data scientist okay love of math understanding of statistics excel maybe or some other thing like tableau or what whatever and an affinity and a facility with large data sets and exposure to data mining techniques and then i have highlighted in red here business domain knowledge that is something that we tend to kind of ignore if you do if you go on youtube and uh, look for uh, for uh, any kind of uh, uh, data science or, or data analytics kind of topic you will see that a large number of videos are actually by indians indian instructors and i'm sure there there are an equally large number of uh, videos by chinese too but they are that they are probably speaking mandarin so we probably don't get get to see it what i'm trying to say is that there is a depth of uh, of a uh, technical knowledge in both these countries india in particular and maybe in china as well but they don't seem to succeed that well when it comes to going up the corporate ladder probably because the inability to appreciate the need for the business domain knowledge and the and the ability to uh, to communicate technical solutions to the business domain okay so i'm going to harp on that uh, a couple of more times to drive that home okay all right just so harping on it once more right here communication skills to present the technical solution as a simple business recommendation is what is needed okay so there are different skill sets that you need i talked about the need for communication but what if you have only communication skills and nothing else then you are basically hot air there's nothing else you can do there okay but if you add something like statistics a mathematical technical skill to that okay then what you get is if you have only statistical skills then that would be a data kind of guy a data nerd but if you have both statistics and communication skills then you become a stats professor not totally unlike myself here actually then if you add to that programming skills if you have only programming skills then you are a hacker but if you add statistics to it then you become a r programming or python programming kind of guy okay and if you add communication skills then you become a consultant then you are beginning to add value and if you have communication skills and programming then you are probably a computer science professor again not totally unlike myself i actually do teach a commu computer science course uh, but a math course uh, linear algebra for computer science all right then if you add business that is when everything starts to come together if you have only business knowledge again you are just an accountant but if you add programming then you become the it guy and if you add statistics to then you begin begin to be something like a data scientist wanna be okay but if you have all the four skills then you are a perfect data scientist so that is uh, where you wanna be if you want to be a data scientist but this talk is not really targeted at those people because i don't have the technical uh, uh, details that i'm sharing with you in this uh, short uh, webinar so if you want to be a data scientist then you will have to start taking my courses at smu but i'm targeting 
uh, people uh, with or skills other than programming, that would be a perfect business analyst. And uh, those are the people who might benefit best from, uh, from uh, my talk today. Okay, there's a business question, a business problem that you have to solve. Then based on that, you come up with some data analysis plan or data collection plan, and then you activate that. You do the collection of data or maybe find data that is already there. Then from three, data collection, when you have data, you derive insights. And after that, you come back to the business domain with your recommendations. So in three and four, you're working with data. In five, you're back in the business domain. And there, if you start talking about data and the properties of statistic, statistical properties of data, you have lost the business people. So there, you have to be careful. Your job as a data analyst will actually be between the data collection part and deriving insights part. So you have the data, you need to derive insights, that's where data analytics comes in. So it's a small part in this value chain, in this uh, process, process flow. And the most important skill, even though the sexy part of a data analytics would be the algorithms, you know, the programs, etc., etc., it's actually elsewhere, okay? It's actually elsewhere, the value. So that's something to keep in mind. Communication is the key. So the little uh, uh, vertical arrow that I showed there as data analytics in the previous value chain can be expanded from a practitioner's perspective, from a data uh, scientist perspective. So you have four distinct steps in a data science uh, project or data analytics project. There's EDA, exploratory data analysis, then the data preparation, then the model development, and finally, understanding the output of the model. For the vertical arrow that I showed in the last bad paradigm, where I said data analytics, that is divided into four sections. And again, the sexy part would be the third one, the model development, that is where everybody wants to be. You know, some kind of algorithm, fancy algorithms, new, you know, convoluted neural networks, deep learning, whatever, whatever, that's what you want to be doing. But that is only a smart part, uh, only a very smart part. If you look at this, uh, the time spent on this, 80% of the time will be spent on EDA and data preparation, and maybe 10%, 15% in actually running the model even developing the programs, and then the rest of it will be in interpreting and generating insights that are amenable or, or are digestible to the external world, okay? Keep that in mind. Don't lose perspective of the whole business problem. Don't let's just focus on the technical uh, expertise. That is my message. Now, I know that I'm saying this over and over again because I teach in a management university, so that is our focus. So if you're actually doing this in a computer science class, class, it might be completely different. So we talked about uh, uh, the why and the what, I believe. Now let's look uh, at uh, some little bit of details. How, you how do you classify analytics into different categories based on the method and purpose of what it is that you're trying to do? So analytics can be classified into descriptive analytics, which is like dashboarding. You, you want to know what's happening right now. So monitoring, if you're running a call center, for instance, you want to know how many calls are coming in, how how long each person is uh, taking, and uh, is it increasing? Well, maybe not even that. It's just what's happening right now. Monitoring, dashboarding, that would be descriptive. Then the predictive side would be based on what you know from the history, what happens in the future, what will happen in the future. That would be predictive. And uh, that would be some kind of regression analysis, auto-regression, something like that. And then there is prescriptive analytics, which is kind of more interesting and more value added, whereby knowing what's happening and knowing what's likely to happen, you take action. Actions are prescribed to you by the analytics engine so that you can influence the future. So that is kind of uh, the, the different ways in which you can classify analytics. But that is uh, by method and purpose. So it's from a business perspective. Okay. But from a uh, Technical perspective from uh, the side of uh, algorithms, there are two kinds of uh, uh, algorithms, unsupervised and supervised tools, okay? So unsupervised would be pattern discovery, supervised would be pattern recognition or pattern learning, learning patterns, okay? So unsupervised, the question is, do, you ha do we have pattern? I have a lot of data, does it have any pattern? I don't know, but tell me. So that is what the program will tell you, the algorithm will tell you, it's pattern discovery. Unsupervised means there are no labels to the data points that you have. There are no annotations, okay? So if you have 
a retail shop and you have a large number of customers, let's say you have 1,000 customers, you, you have their spending patterns, etc. In the, in the database, but you don't know what it is that you can use, uh, that what it is that you can derive or learn out of the data set, that would be a pattern discovery. You might be able to cluster customers into three or four different groups to have targeted marketing uh, uh, campaigns, for instance, okay? Another thing is if you have transactional data, lots of people buying and uh, buying different things in different baskets, you can derive information about uh, what it is that people are likely to buy together. That would be a market basket analysis, okay? Those are both uh, data with no labels, no annotations, but discovering patterns. But the second one is about you have the data, you know the pattern, but can kind of computer use it? That would be a pattern recognition or learning, okay? That is supervised in a sense, you have, you already know the pattern, so you can label the data. So I'll illustrate it using uh, an example very soon, okay? So this will be things like face recognition. You give a large number of photos of one person to the computer, or many people to the computer, and then you give a new photo to the computer and can recognize whose face it is, okay? So face recognition, classification, decision support, okay? Regression for kind of time series analysis for prediction. All those things will fall under that category, okay? So let's look at uh, a clustering algorithm. Suppose I give a bunch of uh, photos to a computer, photos of animals actually, to a computer, okay? So I have this as an animator screen. I hope it comes through, okay? And then you tell the computer that you have two kinds of animals. Can the computer actually put them in two sensible groups so that they, the animals are segregated, okay? Without your help, without any further help. But you do have to tell them that there are two kinds of animals. Tell the computer that there are two kinds of animals. Beyond that, there's nothing else, okay? So a um, computer may not be able to do this perfectly, but a child, if you give, ask uh, your five-year-old to do this, he will be able to do, he or she will be able to do it. This is about pattern discovery, okay? So the keywords here will be clustering, there are algorithms like uh, k-means clustering, hierarchical clustering algorithms, etc., etc. okay? So it's useful in things like grouping customers, uncovering hidden patterns, etc. So the next slide is animated. Hopefully you can see this. So you have one photo, the so second photo, horse, horse, tiger, horse, tiger, tiger, bunch of horses, tiger. So you give these photos to a computer, okay, in some sensible format, and ask computer that there are, tell the computer that there are two kinds of uh, animals here. Can the computer put them in two groups? So a computer can indeed do it by using something like k-means algorithm, not specifically in this image recognition pro problem, but in uh, if you have data sets, if tigers and uh, horses were actually data points, then it would create uh, two sets of uh, uh, points, group them together, have something like a, like a bisecting uh, uh, boundary between them, etc., etc. Okay, so this can be done. So that will be clustering. But if you go to Amazon and buy a book, for instance, something like by David Nichols, if you haven't read uh, David Nichols, I would highly recommend it. Very good writer. You know, 20 or 30 years from now, you will be hearing about him rather than other people, I think, my guess. So I have read quite a few of his. So if I wanted to buy this one day, Amazon will come and tell me that there is this book called Us, Startup for 10, The Understudy, etc., etc., by the same author. How does Amazon know that I would be interested in uh, these things? It's not so much that it's by the same author. It's because Amazon knows that somebody who bought one day has already bought other books in the past. So I'm likely to do the same thing, okay? So that is a, a cross-selling opportunity, okay? So uh, a cartoon here is uh, if you buy something. Customers who bought bananas also bought carrots, etc., etc. So there's a cartoon, okay? So that is uh, market basket analysis. So it's also called association mining. Now that is uh, unsupervised learning. Now, supervised learning will be about uh, things like churn models, face recognition, fingerprint recognition, etc. So, suppose I have data, again, the same kind of data that I had before, uh, tigers and uh, horses. Okay, so let's go over to classification, which is a supervised learning technique. So, suppose you have 
pictures of different animals. At the same time, you have the label or the name of the animal whose picture it is. Okay, suppose you have that. So you have a tiger with a tiger label, horse, horses with horse label, tiger, 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 tiger again, a horse, a horse label, etc. So basically you have pictures along with its labels. And if you have that, can a computer learn the pattern and then use it? That is pattern recognition, that is supervised learning. It's called supervised because somebody supervised the photos and attached labels or annotations to it, okay? So you have the data and then you have the label. So the label becomes another column in the data table, technically. Now, if you come back to the system and give it a new photo that the computer hasn't seen, and then ask the question, what is that? Is it a tiger or is it a horse? It will be able to tell you almost certainly every single time. But that is interesting. But suppose you give a different photo. Suppose you give that photo. What do you think it's going to tell you? I haven't done this, but I would think that it's going to tell you that it's a tiger because it has only ti it knows only tigers or horses. So it's, this is going to be closer to a tiger than a horse. And the other guy, which is a donkey, will be tagged as a horse because it's closer to a horse, same family or whatever. So it's not perfect in some sense. You have to be careful about the business context in which you're operating this. But if you know that you have only tigers and horses, then this program is a good one. So business applications of uh, uh, classification, classification kind of algorithms would be uh, loan approval. Suppose you have, uh, again, I'm talking from the perspective of a bank. Suppose you want to approve a loan, you have parameters, the data from the customer, from the other, other loans or other instruments that the person owns, external data, credit rating, etc. And then you can come up with uh, one classification, one flag, okay, yes or no. So how, do you, how does it work? You have a large amount of data. People have already approved or, or rejected loans before. So you can say that, okay, this, these data points, they got rejected. These data points, they got accepted. So that would become the training data. You throw it to a computer, ask it to learn the pattern without really telling you what the pattern is and how much weightage went into different uh, components, etc., etc. You just let the computer learn it. And then you give a new customer the same kind of data and the, customer, uh, the, the bank will co come back to you and tell you it's good or bad to give a loan to this, cust this customer. Okay, again, without telling you how it is actually doing it most, in most cases. All right. So that is, this is, I'm pretty sure this is actually being done in the bank already. I don't think approvals are actually done by hand anymore. But there is another thing called counterparty credit risk management. This is something I have some exposure, had some exposure to when I was in the bank. And uh, this was usually done using uh, credit limits or credit ratings. And I think it's still done that way. But can you take the existing data, the previous decisions that were taken as labels, and can you just train a model, a classification model, a supervised learning model to do this? So that is a question that I asked uh, my uh, uh, students, the managers, the bank managers at that time, okay? So one thing you have to remember is that when you do training, the training data is very important. If the training data is, data is garbage, the insight that will come out is garbage, garbage in, garbage out. So that is this uh, thing uh, that I wrote here, GIGO, garbage in, garbage out, okay? The models are only as good as the training data. Okay. So now uh, classification was into different classes. So the, the prediction was into discrete uh, classes, discrete numbers. But if you are actually trying to predict a continuous number, a continuous number, okay, then it's called a regression. So it's so if you have trends in the past, like say stock market price of a, or, or yeah the the share price of a particular index or a particular company, and you want to know what is going to co cost in the or how much uh, you, you how much is going to be in the future, that would be a regression analysis, a time series regression analysis, okay. Don't try this because it never works. And the regression analysis will never give you a predicted stock market price. You will be disappointed. Okay. 
but you can use it for cash flow in, in businesses, revenue, uh, cash flow analysis. You know, if you if you know that a, bus- a company was making uh, 1 million, 1.2 million, 1.5 million, 1.7 million in the few last few years, how much is it going to make next year is a fairly straightforward linear regression analysis. Okay. But it's not limited to just uh, time series data. One example that is in the standard data set is uh, used car pricing, using variables like mileage, the age of the car, uh, the new car price of the same model, etc., etc. That would be a linear regression, multiple linear regression. Okay. So I have in my class I had 130 students, so I collected data from them uh, some time ago to do some kind of research project. So this is the data I collected. I have. Uh, uh, the weight and height of people and I had a distribution like this so it, this is a uh, weight versus height okay uh, I have the height in the x-axis in centimeter and weight in the y-axis in uh, kilogram so that you can see that there is a something like a line so you can use that if you if somebody else comes with a height of 190 the most likely uh, weight is going to be something a little below 80 so this is the kind of uh, analysis that you can do. If you can add more variables, then it becomes some, this is a two-dimensional analysis. It could be three-dimensional or even multi-dimensional beyond that. In this particular case, just for the heck of it, you can see two different groups roughly. There are, there are some people with heights, say, around 160, with weights like 50 to 55 or so. There's one group of people. Another group of people with uh, height around say 175-180 or so with weight probably around say 70 kilos or 71 kilos or something like that. So what are these two groups? If you throw this data to a to a clustering algorithm, k-means clustering for instance, and ask it to create two groups, it will actually create those two groups. And you can see immediately that one is uh, would be boys, the other one would be girls. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Girls tend to be shorter and uh, lighter and guys tend to be taller and heavier. There's one guy here at a height of 170, so a bit shorter than average, but quite a bit heavier than average, 80, so an outlier there. Do you know who that is? Well, that was me actually, because I put my data also in the same data set. All right, moving on. Okay, so this is what we did. We looked at machine learning algorithms as a, as a like a bird's eye view, overview, and we said that they could be divided into two kinds, unsupervised or supervised. Unsupervised would be pattern discovery. That would be algorithms like clustering or associations mining. In clustering, you had k-means clustering, hierarchical. These are the, the buzzwords you might have to remember if you are not a data scientist, but a, ma- a manager managing data science kind of projects. Supervised would be uh, classification or regression. In regression, you have autoregression, or linear regression or multiple linear regression, etc., etc. So that is that is the overview of different machine learning algorithms. So I called it the biggest of big data, text data. Well, technically it's not big in terms of volume, but it's big in terms of information density. Okay, if you have a statement like Manoj is talking, that actually paints a picture that contains quite a bit of information. But if you want to show that in video, that will take this little video that you're seeing, that will take quite a bit of bytes. So the density of information in text data is quite high. In that sense, text data is big. So that's my justification of calling it the biggest of big data, okay, text analytics. All right, so the problem with big data or text analytics per se is the fact that it's unstructured. There's no structure to it. It could be small body of text, huge body of text. It's not in a table format and it's got meaning. Okay. So if you want to use it, there are avenues where business questions can be answered using it. So if you want to answer a particular business question, that will be like getting information out of a, a body of text or so multiple bodies of text, getting the most relevant document, etc. That would be inf- information retrieval. Okay. And there could be sentiment analysis. You could have, for instance, people talking about your company or your brand online, okay? And if you have data in text format, 
you might want to create da data tables out of it, okay? That would be generating structured data. And then topic discovery would be another thing. If you have a lot of tweets or a lot of text documents, what is it that they're talking about? What are the, the, the dominant topics in the text? That will be of interest, okay? All right, so where do you get the text from? Usually from social media kind of analysis or from web scraping, okay? So the question is, where do you get the data from and what do you do with it when you get the data, okay? So text analytics is not the same as uh, data mining because text is a different kind of data. The idea is to derive high quality information from text, high quality information, that's my buzzword. And I'll tell you what I mean by it in the next few slides, okay? All right, so it actually lies in the intersection of getting the inform information, information retriever, NLP, natural language processing, which is like computational linguistics, and then data mining, which will be the tools that are used on data, not on text per se, but on data, okay? And in order to actually process text, once it is represented in some kind of a mathematical form, like a vector, then you use machine learning techniques or statistics, okay? So high quality information. Suppose you get some text like this, you're a busy person, you don't have time to sit around and read the whole thing, but a computer can read, read this in a couple of milliseconds and generate a summary. That would be a task by, by a smart text mining program. That is a concise summaries, readable concise summaries based on text. That is uh, what you have in the amber box there is high quality information based on the blue box, okay, concise summaries. Another one, suppose you have some information that you scraped about Facebook and Twitter, some details about their, where they are and when they started, etc. You might want to put that in a database or in a table so that you can do further an analysis. Creating that structured data out of unstructured text would be creating or generating high quality information. That's another one. Another question, suppose I told you earlier today that SMU has uh, six schools, but suppose you didn't hear it and you want to find out how many it has and then you go and uh, look in Wikipedia, you get the, all the text there and you want to read all that, all those things to figure out how many, how many schools, how many departments we have. And a text analytics program can actually locate the information and answer the question saying SME has six schools. That would be high quality information, okay? Exact, exact answers based on text document. So it's very high quality information because only one statement saying, or just one number saying six, that is the answer, but it comes from a, a body of text. Not easy to locate hu by human beings, but very easy to actually locate by a smart text analytics program. Okay, sentiment analysis and it's another one. This is about some uh, uh, restaurants, mm -hmm. positive or negative uh, sentiments and why, okay? That is again, sentiment would be another high quality text information. Now, so that is, those are the application areas of uh, this. And uh, my, I'm actually going to teach uh, text analytics uh, next term uh, as an elective for, uh, I think, later years of, uh, of uh, information uh, system students. And uh, then the, some of these slides are actually from those things I'm preparing now. Language understanding is not easy even for human beings, but it's really terrible for computers, okay? First of all, we have to even say what we mean by meaning, okay? So we have to translate each word into a number and say that, okay, these numbers mean the same thing, even though we may not be able to actually say what the meaning is, okay? All right, so what's the problem with that? There is, there is ambiguity everywhere. Suppose somebody comes and says he has an ap apple. What does that mean? I have an apple, but that is my apple computer. Somebody else might have an apple because that is an apple the fruit she has an orange and he has an apple that's one way of looking at apple she has a pc and he has an apple is another way of looking at the same word that is lexical ambiguity okay then there is syntactic that is the structure of grammatical ambiguity if i come and say sammy ate cookies on the floor what does that mean okay it could mean that sammy is actually picking up cookies from the floor and eating or he's sitting on the floor and eating, okay? The question is, who is on the floor? Or what is on the floor? Is it the cookies or is it Sammy, okay? That is called prepositional phrase attachment on 
the floor does that attach to the word eight or does that attach to cookies that is an ambiguity that is a structural syntactic kind of an ambiguity and there is semantic ambiguity ambiguity is related to the meaning so if i say something like uh, nick met nat in the lift lobby and then they went to his house his what does it mean what's the meaning what's the semantic significance of the the pronoun his is it does it attach to nick or nat so that is another kind of ambiguity there's core reference resolution that uh, that needs to be done all these things are from na natural language pro processing or computational ling linguistics there are solutions for this with varying degrees of success okay one more kind of ambiguity in the english language if you have a kind of ambiguity based dialects of english if you go to the uk you have one set of words with the exact same meaning you have a different set of words in the in the us lift versus elevator petrol versus gas or gasoline flat versus apartment etc etc okay then there is a sentence level ambiguities coming from uh, synonyms for instance there are two sentences here he was saddened by the news the news depressed him the the sentences mean the same thing but they look like completely different kinds of sentences okay or different meanings so yeah, there are problems like this that's why natural language processing which is actually a precursor or preprocessor to text mining is is quite hard okay so text summarization is a is a potential application information extraction uh, unstructured data text to structured data tables question answering that would be another uh, use or application of text analytics sentiment an analysis or opinion mining mining and topic modeling these are the different uh, different things that we can do with text analytics okay so why do we want to do text analytics because copious amount of amounts of data is being generated by customers not just in terms of uh, of uh, you know blogs and uh, or or tweets etc also reports business data and also most importantly customer data in terms of uh, customer calls okay actual real audio calls can be transcribed to to words and uh, text by machines and can be used as f with uh, text mining algorithm actually it's actually being done even when you're doing a uh, uh, voice searches on uh, youtube or or, or your, on your siri it's not just trying to understand what you're saying but it's also trying to understand the context so that it gives you the right kind of uh, it picks out the right kind of uh, words to, to answer one important thing is that reviews and complaints are first logged in uh, you know, on on the social media so that is important if you want to want to make sure that your brand is uh, well respected you have to make sure that the reviews and opinions and the tweets are all all well respected otherwise it will really affect your bottom line and reviews and tweets all have tangible uh, impact on your bottom line okay basically because brand lives online these days okay really when i want to buy something i go and uh, look at uh, reviews i don't really look at uh, uh, product reviews or product uh, uh, publicity kind of pages but i look at people co consumer reviews even those are being influenced by uh, nefarious means these days okay all right so there are questions like uh, customer service calls audios can it be transcribed to text and could you figure out where the bugs are using the textual data okay not really debugging the the program but by looking at the textual data using text mining on the data can you figure out what features will need more work okay or, or bug fixing really and we and then the next question i was asking is if you have images and video can you figure out there are bad placements for your brand okay again a business question Again, we may not be able to sit through all the uh, all the video or look through all the images, but a computer can do it in a, in a fairly reasonable amount of time. So that's where text analytics comes in. What I'm trying to say is that other forms of uh, big data, like uh, images and videos and audio, can actually become text and drive into a text analytics program to derive business value. So that's what I wanted to say. 
So that brings me to the end of my talk. I'm, I just have this slide to wrap it here, okay? So I talked about the, the four pillars of uh, four mega trends of uh, the changes in the data landscape. On the supply side, how the data is being created, the huge volume, the explosion of data, and the demand side, the pull side of data, the requirements, the service and uh, improvements and new, new business models, etc., And also the velocity requirement, how and why people require immediate, instantaneous, uh, real-time insights being generated. That can be, can be done only by data analytics. I forgot to mention that. You cannot have a human being generating real-time insights because it takes time for a person to do it. But if it is deployed in an automated uh, setting, data analytics can actually generate uh, automated uh, insights. And all these things are standing on top of technology in innovations on the hardware space as well as software space. Okay. We talked about the mega trends in the data and then we talked about uh, data analytics. Data analytics really is about automated generation of insights. Okay. Real time insight generation. All right. And we talked about different tools or algorithms that we have in data analytics with the view to uh, informing you about the right tool for the right kind of question, okay? If you have the, the right tool, you get the right answer to the question asked, but the question also has to be right, okay? So that is important. You have to have the right question to get the right answer. If you have the wrong question, the answer is wrong. If you have the wrong tool, the answer is wrong. So you have to get everything right. So that is kind of all I wanted to say. The last topic was text analytics, and it's I think it is not being harnessed to the extent it could be. And I have this warning, ignore it at your peril. By your, I mean your business. Okay, If you ignore it, it may not be the right thing from the perspective of the bottom line. So that brings me to the end of uh, this session.